Prince Philip has crashed his gun bus into the middle of a media carnival. The Duke of Edinburgh, who died on Friday the 9th of April 2021, says he wants a no-fuss funeral, and at the heart of it, he wants his coffin transported by the Sandringham Shoot gun bus, which he designed and used on shoot days at the Queen's Norfolk estate. In this week's show, a filmed obituary of a great shooting man, we will look at where Prince Philip went shooting. We will hear from the man himself, how he put field sports at the heart of international conservation. We're going to talk bears and bearskins. There will still be news and there will still be hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Land Rover specialist Foley's in Essex builds gun buses as well as other Land Rover based overland adventure tools and toys. The expectation is that the Duke of Edinburgh, as a final salute to his love of shooting sports, has requested his coffin arrives at St George's Chapel in a 130 Defender gun bus, one very much like this. It could well be the one that Foley supplied to Sandringham just a few years ago. Right, Stuart, one of your glorious gun buses. Just walk us through it, if you wouldn't mind, please. What right. have we got here? We have a 130 Defender uh, TD5 that's been built to the customer's specifications so we uh, the body is ex-army and uh, it's an ambulance body we strip it out and we fit the seats and everything you see in there from the french oak to the aluminium to the the green vinyl or leather seats depending on what you want and everything from the step to the handles to the lights to the to, to, to everything you see is custom made to each client so you don't know what sort of donor vehicle you're going to get almost, do you? No, it depends. I tend to always use the best donor car I can use. Okay. And then we build it from there up, whether it be on a galvanised chassis or, or and, and colour is an important thing. It's normally Keswick green or deep bronze green are the two, uh, the two colours that are, are most favourable. Any outrageous colours? Uh, uh, no, I did a bright blue one once. <laughs> it's, okay. Uh, so, people you have coming to commission these things, do you get some some people that really know what they want, or is it uh, a lot of it that you offer? Generally, everyone bus? knows what they're trying to create, um, and that is a comfortable gun bus to fulfil the day's shooting. And uh, and and this is what we've built many of these, and this seems to be the most suitable. It's got to be functional, it's got to be face to face, so the seats are always face to face, so they have, uh, they've, uh, they've got that contact when, uh, obviously you can have contact, Covid hasn't done much uh, yeah. for, for the last year, <laughs> but, but, but it's all about uh, being together in the back of, of a Land Rover and, uh, and going across those fields, uh, and that's what a Land Rover can do. What makes you so sort of proud of your, your products? I just think it's the workmanship and the fact we listen to the clients. We do what they want, we build what they want, and uh, hopefully we deliver what they want. So if, as we expect, Prince Philip's coffin does arrive in a Land Rover gun bus on Saturday, it will be quite a statement, which we hope the wider media do not choose to ignore. The reason for the Sandringham gun bus is to transport guns around the Sandringham chute. The reason for the Sandringham chute is to provide great shooting and great conservation of rare species. The 20,000 acres in the Norfolk coast area of outstanding natural beauty has the Grade 2 listed Sandringham House at its heart, but it is the estate where Prince Philip was able to put his conservation ideas into action, turning it into that rarest of things, a truly wild bird shoot. Even before the 1950s, the GWT were involved with an annual monitoring of um, grey partridges. Uh, at Sandringham Estate. So we, we've got some you know, fantastic records of uh, grey partridge numbers uh, from Sandringham and other um, you know, big estates in, in Norfolk. You know, going back generations, it's a fantastic database. Like all farms in the States, grey partridges declined at Sandringham um, through the 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s, and they declined because of these you know, you know, widely known um, you know, causes now, you know, changes in agriculture. But Prince Philip was very sensitive uh, to those changes and, and, and very aware 
um, that you know, Sandringham needed to you know, bring about a recovery of grey partridges um, once we knew the reasons for their decline. So from about 2000 onwards, uh, the whole estate, um, so from you know, Prince Philip down you know, with the land agent, with the, you know, the head gamekeeper, um, beekeepers, working closely with the farmers, brought about this you know, incredible recovery in the wild grey partridge population. Sandringham has always been a, a wild bird shoot, um, but it was really from the 70s, 80s and 90s that the, the wild pheasant was the, uh, the primary species. But um, since 2000, um, now you've got you know, good, healthy populations of wild grey partridges um, alongside a uh, flourishing wild pheasant stock as well. He um, understood that if you wanted to restore uh, a population of wild grey partridges, you need to provide a healthy environment in order for them to uh, uh, flourish. And so he recognised the importance of uh, overwinter cover, of nesting cover, of insect rich brood room cover, um, winter and spring feeding, uh, but then also uh, a, a very good and efficient targeted predation control programme as well. Shooting and conservation go hand in hand at Sandringham and in Prince Philip's patronages. He was president of the British Association for Shooting and Conservation, Basque, and he visited Basque headquarters, Marford Mill in Cheshire. Well, I think Prince Philip was the antithesis of the armchair conservationist. He was a man who knew exactly what it takes to make landscapes, habitats uh, and wildlife flourish. He understood um, the role that, that man has to play in, in helping nature to achieve balance. And in that, he very much understood the role that shooting uh, and hunting have to play as very powerful drivers of practical conservation. And let's not forget, this, this was a man who was talking about climate change and biodiversity crises decades before these became fashionable terms. So the man was a, a conservation visionary. He was very concerned with um, the conservation of species rather than individual members of species. And these are all attributes that he, he shares with a great many of his fellow uh, sportsmen and, and conservationists. Uh, and to those who would, who would say that his uh, love of field sports uh, somehow runs contrary to the ideals of conversa uh, conservation, uh, I, I would say to them they, they need to get out of their armchairs a bit more often. In his speech to Basque staff in 2010, Prince Philip stressed the importance of shooting to the health of the UK's wildlife. If I think about the justification for shooting, is that when I leave Sandringham, and sometimes drive across the fens on the way to London. Or, um, the moment you leave Sandringham and round about there, you don't see a living thing of any kind whatsoever, not even a bird or, or a hare or a rabbit or nothing across the fens. And, and I think that uh, it just shows that if you're a keeper of the state, you'll find everything there. We've, we've heard that uh, the Sandringham gun bus uh, may well be used to carry Philip's uh, coffin. The palace hasn't confirmed that yet, but um, I'll just say that if it does happen, there could be no more uh, fitting send-off for a, a true British sportsman and countryman. Now, all this puts the British media in a tizzy. There was a time when journalists reported what they saw and what they found out. Today, when you give them an idea they can't cope with, they struggle. In its coverage of Prince Philip's death, ITV had to ask Sir David Attenborough to explain the link between shooting and conservation. The, the early hunters in the, in the empire, as it then was, were the first conservationists. And they founded the first, first conservation movements long before the World Wildlife Fund. And there's a link to the full interview in the description below. Back in the 1950s, and the media celebrated Prince Philip's hunting exploits. Here he is in the Gambia, shooting a crocodile. His life straddled a time when big game hunters were national heroes, too, a time when they became media villains. And one of his own hunts was the pivot for this, in Nepal with the Queen in 1961. I spoke to modern day big cat hunter Dr. Prashant Singh from Uttarakhand, who shoots man eaters for the Indian government today. Although he's too young to have been on a driven tiger hunt, which were banned in the 1970s, Dr. Singh explains what is going on in this rare footage of Prince Philip's hunt. 
what used to happen is that first and foremost, they would try to locate the, what is called as a rehan. Rehan is the residence of the tiger, where, where the animal stays. And it's normally thick undergrowth. So once you located where the tiger was, then they would put up this white canvas and uh, there were beaters who would come. So uh, in a forest, you normally have shades of green and brown. So a tiger does not recognize white, uh, I mean, those huge big cloth which used to be put up. So that used to scare the tigers. So, uh, in Nepal, what they normally did was they would put up a wall of white canvas and drive the tiger into it and then surround the entire wall, uh, surround the area. It was like a big enclosure. And then they would get these elephants, shikar elephants. They were specially trained for tiger hunting. And these elephants would come in and trample on the grass and uh, create a shooting line, basically, uh, clear the area so that the animal could be shot. So they would get in from anything from one tiger to more than three or four tigers into the area. And the tiger would just not leave that area. It would stick to the area because the moment it came close to the white canvas, it would, get, it would just go back. It would not cross over or come out of that uh, enclosure. They would do the shooting from elephant back, which is not really so easy because an elephant is always on the move and it's not a stable platform. Like if you're sitting on a machan or a hide, you have that stability. But uh, these elephants are always fidgeting around, moving around. So you have to be a good shot and you have to get a clean shot to get the tiger. Otherwise, an injured animal can be very, very dangerous. In fact, they always say that uh, the first shot is the most important and dangerous game turns dangerous after the first shot is fired. So, so the shooting was, it wasn't easy shooting tigers even from elephant back. And then these injured tigers, they have the strength and the power to jump up. And there were times when they would maul the elephant or the Mahawat or the hunters as well. They, they, they have the power to just jump on and they're very powerful beasts and very fast and strong. Ever since there's been a ban on hunting, we have a very rich biodiversity in India, but unfortunately, since the revenue is not there, uh, wildlife is uh, the last priority in the list. It's been enormous fun researching Prince Philip's hunting exploits. He had an extraordinary life, and over and over again, I hear the same, that banning hunting is a surefire way of wiping out wildlife. It's been fascinating finding out what an all-round sportsman Prince Philip was. Here he is, punt gunning with the actor James Robertson Justice. It's also been fun listening to stories about Prince Philip, including this one, and you'll have to forgive the audio. The line was terrible. I spoke to Pakistani politician Kunwar Khalid Yunus about the time he went duck shooting with his father, Prince Philip, and Pakistan's president, Ayub Khan. My father was police inspector, and uh, that was the uh, deal with security. That day, my college is off, so he asked me, why don't you come with me, son? Because I also did uh, shooting for the ducks, uh, mallards and uh, pintails and blah, blah, blah. I used to come to the lakeside, which is about 70 miles from Karachi. But here I saw the prince uh, with the, after we descended on the place, which is a private lake. And uh, I remember that they both are good shooters, the president, Ayub Khan, as well as the uh, prince. And I saw from a distance that uh, uh, he uh, shot many birds. He later on, my father told me that son, uh, Prince was angry. <laughs> he was annoyed. And my I asked him why. Then he told me that uh, somebody steal his uh, ducks. Well, I think uh, it must be done by the presidential staff. There you are. Even on a harmless duck shoot, Prince Philip can cause a diplomatic incident. We will miss him. Thanks to everyone who took part in that film, to the Field Sports Nation, to Basque, and to the SCI and its Life Hunter Advocate Society for supporting it. Now, we're keeping it royal in this episode. We're finding out about the bear skins the Guards regiments wear at Buckingham Palace. Where do those bears come from? And are there many left? And we are devoting the whole of hunting YouTube to Prince Philip and the royal family's love of the outdoors.
Next, let's go to our own Prince Charming. It's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. For the second time in five years, driven grouse shooting is to be debated in Westminster. Chris Packham's Wild Justice Group is forcing the event, which takes place outside the main parliament chamber. He claims that driven grouse shooting is bad for people, the environment and wildlife, and there are better uses for England's uplands. Parliament scheduled the event to happen last year, but postponed it due to lockdown restrictions. Last time, MPs led by Rishi Sunak, who represents Richmond in Yorkshire, queued up to defend grouse shooting. The new date for the debate is the 26th of April. Antis have lined up to condemn Prince Philip. Co-leader of the Scottish Greens, Patrick Harvey, says his movement would not seek to reconcile conservation with the blood sport of the wealthy, which he says is out of step with today's values, though he admits that a debt is owed to those whose environmentalism did achieve global awareness. Many have spoken about Prince Philip's environmentalism. Today's environmental movement overwhelmingly places responsibility for the global crisis on the powerful and would not seek to reconcile conservation with the blood sport of the wealthy. Other antis left abusive messages under our film paying tribute to Prince Philip. It's not a good week for the antis. Basque is the new sponsor of the Yorkshire Post Rural Awards and dinner in Harrogate in October, which positions the newspaper firmly in favour of country sports. One anti said the move is part of a pyramid of corruption that stretches to the House of Lords. Bless. A Cornish council is under fire for wanting to stop its pesky gull problem. Natural England denied the town of Lou's application to control seagulls. Social media users went a step further, suggesting people should not live by the sea if they don't like gulls. Others declared they would boycott Lou. Natural England told Cornwall Live website that it recommended a package of measures to keep gull numbers in check. As Field Sports News has reported, gull numbers are pests in some areas, forcing councils to shell out thousands of pounds to locals to protect their properties and businesses. A family that runs a free-range chicken farm has had death threats from vegans. James Matthews and Shanice Plumstead said phone callers threatened to kill them and their two children at their farm in Buckinghamshire. Separately, the Vegan Society is claiming victory after forcing a college to allow a vegan student to skip a module of her animal management diploma course that would have seen her work on a farm and visit an abattoir. Fiji Willits insists she was told she needed to complete the farming module to pass until pressure from the Vegan Society convinced the college in Filton, Bristol to change the rules. North Wales Police has dismissed claims that a hunt broke the law because of a lack of evidence. North Wales hunt saboteurs at the Flint and Denby hunt in September last year claimed a fox was deliberately targeted after hounds picked up its scent. The sabs gave the police photos and videos, but the rural crime team said it didn't pass the threshold required to prove an offence under the Hunting Act. The sabs say the cops delayed the case until the six-month time ran out, a claim denied by North Wales Police. Politicians are planning a law change to target pet thefts. After a massive rise in dog napping, an amendment to the policing bill could make stealing pets an offence punishable by two years in prison, according to the Daily Mail. In recent years, the government has resisted increasing penalties for people who steal dogs, then sell them on. Demand for puppies for some breeds has risen to thousands of pounds over the past year. A 76-year-old French poacher has been sentenced after trapping robins and then skewering them ready for barbecues. The unnamed pensioner from Provence was handed a year in jail and fined 450 euros for using illegal traps to capture the birds, which are a protected species. His age means he's unlikely to go to prison. Authorities say the man sold barbecue-ready robins and other small birds from 30 to 50 euros each. Safari Club International is fighting for wolf hunting in the USA. The advocacy group stepped in to try and stop three lawsuits challenging the removal of grey wolves from the US Endangered Species Act. The US Fish and Wildlife Service crossed the grey wolf off the list of threatened species in October 2020, after what has been described as one of America's greatest conservation success stories. Grey wolves have been on the list for 45 years. 
The SCI was instrumental in the delisting and is working with the NRA to make sure it's not reversed. A big game hunter is trying to raise money for conservation on the OnlyFans website. Michaela Fialova from the Czech Republic, who has made films with us, started hunting when she was 13 and became involved in conservation when she moved to South Africa. The so-called sexy hunter is sharing photos on subscription website OnlyFans to fund conservation. In just a week, she raised £3,000. Aussie duck hunters are celebrating a win after Victoria's state government did a U-turn on bag limits. After a review of the Game Management Authority data, the government increased bag limits for the 2021 season from two to five. It's also lifted restrictions on teal. Shooters, fishers and farmers party politician Jeff Borman points out that Victoria is the only state hit this year by rules lowering bag limits and shooting days. And finally, an autopsy on an alligator has solved a more than two decade old mystery. South Carolina hunter Ned McNeely took the massive 12 foot alligator he caught to a game meat plant, which cut it open, spilling out several dog collars. One of them had a phone number that still worked and the hunter who picked up said the collars were from his deer dogs, which disappeared 24 years ago in the same area the gator was found. Meat plant owner Kevin Cordry, who stuffs gators after turning their meat into sausages, said he isn't surprised as he's always hearing stories about dogs being snatched. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Now, you may have seen this picture of Prince Hello. Philip in the uniform of Hello. the Grenadier Guards making Her Majesty giggle. At the funeral on Saturday, you will see bands, representative detachments, pallbearers, piping parties and guards of honour drawn from across the services. Have you ever wondered where guardsmen get their bearskins? That's right, from bears. David has been off to find out more. We can't miss this opportunity, Jonathan. Tell us <laughs> about the this. bearskin cap. So the bearskin cap came into wear after the, the Battle of Waterloo, where the Grenadier Guards in 1831 seized Waterloo and took the caps from the, the French. So the officers ones, we always remember, officers get that little bit more. So theirs is slightly taller. Theirs sits about 18 inches in height, whereas a guardsman and another ranks would usually sit about 12 to 13 inches. If I get one quickly, I steal this Welsh Guardsman's here. You can see there is a slight difference in height from the two skins. The skins are taken from male bears because um, during the mating season, these things can get quite scratched up, as you can imagine. So the male bears, we predominantly take them from the male bears from the belly region for the officers. And the other ranks, um, guardsmen's and to company sergeant majors, get the, 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 the ones, the, the pelts from the back of the actual bear. Um, and you can see there is, a, there is a noticeable difference between the two. But yeah, they're absolutely spectacular. They get looked after, they get shampooed and conditioned by their, their loving owner. It's a natural product. This one's actually came back from reconditioning where the, the lining's been redone. The leather banding has been put back in and the bamboo cage has been renewed. So the skin itself is, is, is quite easily 20, 30 years old, but everything inside is, is redone every so many years or as and when required. So yeah, absolutely fantastic bit of kit. Doesn't weigh a lot. Um, when it gets wet, naturally water repellent. We've, we've tried to use synthetic skins in the past in the early, early and late 90s. Uh, we used a number of fox pelts, dyed black, didn't work. We then, Linda McCartney then designed a couple. We went with a synthetic one and the water repellency on it was atrocious. It didn't work. Went static, coming back in, they, they just didn't work. So they've all been taken out of circulation and we went back to the good old fashioned natural resources. These bears are culled. We're not sending people out there. The, the, the population of black bears in, in America, North America and Canada are managed, so we we, we take up part of that slack and, and we use the resources that are available to us. And that's, that's, that's how we've got the bearskin still to this day. 
Thank you, Jonathan. Now from Wellington Barracks to what would normally be the wider world of hunting and shooting, but this week is devoted to one man. This is Hunting YouTube, and in a changed scheduled programming this week, I'm looking back on the life of Prince Philip, the shooter and conservationist on YouTube. Eight videos that help explain his and his family's philosophy about how hunting conserves wildlife. Prince Philip was one of the first environmental activists, though he disliked piety and what he called bunny huggers. Here's a short film charting his life's work as an activist. Prince Philip, as we can see from the gun bus used at his funeral, put field sports at the heart of much of his public work. Today, metropolitan broadcasters hate that, but there was a time when they simply reported it. Like this footage from 1977 of the Queen and Prince Philip at their Scottish home, Balmoral Castle. A little more from Balmoral, this film of the Gillies Ball, which takes place at the end of the royal family's annual Scottish holiday shows the Queen and Prince Philip dancing and ate some real. Filmed by the BBC in about 1990, it's narrated by the Queen, including the fabulous line, you can do a lot if you are properly trained. I touched on tiger shooting earlier in this programme, and thanks to the support of the Field Sports Nation, we were able to purchase rights to footage of Prince Philip's tiger hunt. Here's another, in colour, in the British Pathé Library. Here's a speech he made to the Australian Conservation Fund in 1973, where he talks about how important it is that different strands of conservation, and that would be shooting and non-shooting, work together. Also in 1973, it's not hunting, but it is outdoors. Here is Prince Philip speaking about the Duke of Edinburgh Awards scheme, when it had clocked 180,000 participants since he launched it in 1956. Today that number has passed 8 million. The shoot at Sandringham was Prince Philip's special love. In this film, his son Prince Edward narrates a personal 25-minute documentary about the Queen's private house and estate in Norfolk. The Queen and her family are regulars at agriculture cultural shows, and Prince Philip also supported the business of British agriculture. Here he is visiting a tea plantation in Cornwall. And finally, it's not just Prince Philip who loves shooting and sees its value for conservation. His grandson, Prince William, talks in this film about the positives of trophy hunting and the negatives of poaching on ITV News. And still, the wider media don't get it. That's it for this week. I have put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the week Top 8, which returns as normal next week, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. And that's it for this week. If you haven't done so, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv, where you can click to like us on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, pop your email address into our register page, and we'll contact you about this show. Field Sports Britain at 7 pm UK time every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting. Good shooting, good fishing, God bless you sir, and goodbye.